All right. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I have Brother Justin Whitland here with me today. Uh, it's just us two. Uh, we are going to be doing the Monday night Bible Q&A, KJV Bible Scope, vlive.tv. Uh, we are doing this live. And if you would like to join in with us live, uh, it would be every Monday night, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Florida Time, USA. And we would like you to join in with us and partake of these Bible Q&As. Uh, you might have a question that you have out of the Bible, uh, maybe during your studies and uh, when you're doing devotional studies or your biblical reading, or even when you're at church and you, you hear the preaching of the word of God, and maybe a question might uh, enter into your mind about the word of God, we would like you to uh, entrust us with your questions, uh, post your questions up um, on an email and send it to us. Uh, that would be trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. And if you uh, send us your questions, uh, we will certainly have a whole week to be able to study these things out. And then uh, the following Monday, uh, normal time, we will try to answer your question on the next Bible Q&A. And hopefully, you know, We'll be able to keep this thing going as well. I would ask you uh, to sincerely consider uh, praying for this ministry, praying for brother me and uh, uh, for me and brother Justin and uh, the other men, uh, brother Mike Basile. Uh, he is out right now, and brother uh, Jason Hill. Uh, he will, uh, Lord willing, get in from time to time when when he is able. He's a very busy guy. Got a uh, full-time job he's doing right now. So uh, he's not able to pop in, uh, even though he is one of our newest members, apart from him joining many, many years ago. So you guys pray for this ministry. We really appreciate that. Now, um, most important question of them all, um, you would think is your question, but uh, here's a question that we would ask you. Um, if you died today, would you have eternal life? Would you have forgiveness of sins? Would you have uh, fellowship or reconciliation with God, a relationship that's lost and undone. Um, that's what man is without God uh, starting off in life. And each person must seek light and ultimately get to the knowledge of the truth of Christ dying on the cross for your sins and his resurrection on the third day. And by trusting and believing on that finished cross work, on that gospel of Christ, you could gain what we were talking about, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, reconciliation to God. What a great thing you could have today if you'd simply humble yourself and put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. I hope you do that. Um, if you're just listening in and if you are a partaker uh, and you, you, you claim to be saved, live your life for Christ every single day. I mean, uh, many, many people follow many other people that aren't living for Christ that claim to be Christian. Uh, let's not go with the flow of everybody else that is not living for Christ, even though they claim to be Christians. Let's follow Christ if nobody else is. And if you do find a brother that's following Christ, better to follow the guy because he's following Christ than to follow somebody that's not following Christ at all. And so I would urge you, I would admonish you, I would exhort you, to keep your eyes focused on Jesus, stay in your Bible, go to church, uh, get around people that are going to pray for the brethren, uh, get around people that are serving the Lord out on the street, uh, going door knocking, witnessing, be a great thing for you. Uh, st stay close to people that will influence you to keep serving Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to let Justin open up. Go ahead, brother. Amen. Thanks, Brother Ed. Thanks for asking questions and keeping it going. Uh, we do want to, uh, to, to actually, I, I'd like to say this. We have a twofold purpose, generally speaking. Our uh, first purpose is if you're not saved, we want you to be saved. We want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. We want you to, be, to have eternal life, to have forgiveness of sin. But for those of you that are saved, we want to encourage you to live in a way that will matter in a hundred years, in a thousand years, in a billion years, because one day <laughs> this life will be over. And you can say, man, I've got eternal life. 
I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Praise be to God. Glad you did. Glad you did. But you're going to a place where everyone will have on display the rewards they received, which really is a simple display of their love for their Savior. That's where you're going. You're going to a place where everybody will there be saved, right? You're talking, you're, you, if you're saved, you're going to be with Jesus Christ in the New Jerusalem and the rest of the church and the saints and all those things. That's great. That's great. But what people will, will uh, what will be uh, visible, what will be known is how much love and, and desire you had towards your Savior, what you wanted to do for him, and you'll receive that. Uh, at the at the day of judgment seat of Christ. So I would encourage you all, listen, if you if you are saved, praise God, live for Christ. There's nothing better you can do with your life. Honestly, you you'd mess it up anyway. <laughs> I'm being honest, I mess it up. Brother Ed messes it up. Just, you know what? Instead of doing what you want to do, do what the Lord wants you to do, you'll find you enjoy Amen. that much better, and it doesn't mess things up. <laughs> Amen. The Lord knows what he's doing. He, he gave us wisdom, direction, guidance, a Bible, so that we could live in a way that pleases him. And uh, not saying everything's going to be sunshine and rainbows, but it's certainly better to please the Lord than it is to please yourself. And, uh, and I, I think you'll find that it's quite joyous, quite uh, full of blessing to serve the Lord. So that's our, our encouragement for you today. Thanks, Brother Ed. Amen. All right. Appreciate that, Brother Justin. Always uh, giving words of admonition and encouragement to live for the Lord. Uh, just, Brother Justin's truly a blessing over the years of just knowing him. Um, always encourages me and uh, anybody that comes around him to serve the Lord and uh, just always pointing to Jesus and it's just a great man to be able to be around. And I, I do appreciate Brother Justin and his family. Uh, very encouraging. And so um, let's go ahead. We're going to dive into this and we're going to start off with the first question here. And it is from Jose Navarro. And I'm going to go ahead and throw that on the screen there. And there it is. Um, and he asked the question two different ways. Um, I'm not sure, uh, maybe the second, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the first question that's asked would probably be more of the uh, intricate or the, the more uh, in tune question that he wants to ask. Is it a sin to withhold intimacy in bed by a married couple? And is it a sin to withhold intimacy in bed in a marriage? Okay, so is it a sin now? I was going to pass this over to Justin because this is, <laughs> but I've been kind of hammering Justin pretty, pretty much lately. I mean, he's been just get, uh, getting on and everything. So I, I'm going to take the heat this time. Um, I know I've been kind of getting out of it at the beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and take some heat here. I'm going to start off answering the, the first question here. Uh, give Justin a break and uh, let him collect his thoughts and everything. And I'm going to do my best. You guys pray for me. Answer this uh this question here is not easy and we'll do our best to keep it Christ honoring as much as we can. And, uh, again, I, I do covet your prayers as we're going through this. Okay. So is it a sin to withhold intimacy in bed by a married couple? So the question would be, I think you could add this in there. What purpose would you have to withhold intimacy in bed if you are married? I would ask that question. Now, again, we're getting personal. We're getting into the lives of, of somebody that's um, in a marriage. And, you know, what business is it of mine to step inside your marriage? And again, you know, a lot of times uh, we need to, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, if I'm correct with the, with the reference, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Now, if you're examining yourselves, whether you be in the faith, and proving your own selves, I think that's going to be a lot greater than me or a pastor or somebody uh, telling you to do something out of the Bible. 
and you're just going by a, a man. You, well, this man's telling me what to do. This man is trying to show me that I'm wrong. Now, if that's your mindset, this, this, this whole this broadcast is not going to be much help because we're going to the Holy Word of God. We're going to the Holy Bible, the mind of God. And as we're giving you these principles, we're trying to give them to you out of the word of God, not some self-help thing, not some book that I've read from some PhD or, or theologian or philosopher. We're going straight to the word of God, the mind of God. And when God says something a lot, I mean, there's times when I'm not even going to know how to explain why he said it that way, but he just says it that way because he's right and I'm not. So we're just going to believe God at his word. And if God says something, let's just believe him at his word. And then God knows what's good, not only for our general life that we live every day, but here it is, but for our own personal relationships in our marriage. Okay. That's, that's, I know it's, it's going to be a tough thing because I'm going to be step. We may step on some toes here, but it's dealing with the word of God and how God views marriage the intimacy of, of marriage. Now go to first Corinthians seven and I know brother Justin probably going to bring you there too. So first Corinthians seven, this is our spot. So go to first Corinthians seven. Um, we can start in verse one. And the Bible says now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, how many people really, obey that part of the, the Bible. I mean, I mean, think about this. I mean, we want to ask questions about intimacy in the bed and so forth, right? But come on, as a Christian, do we really like not touch a woman? Like if, if I'm courting a woman, do I not hold her hand? Do I not kiss her on the mouth or kiss her on the cheek or hug her to show some affection when I'm not even married to her? Do I keep, do I do that? What the Bible says now, if I'm not doing that much, right. And the Bible tells me not to do this and I should obey it. The smallest things to the biggest things that's obedience, right? So if I'm not even going to do that much, why would it matter what happens in the marriage bed? See, what, what, what are you going to listen to from me out of the Bible that's going to make you say, well, I'm going to obey that if you don't even obey that? Are, are, are you with me? Are you with me? It's the mindset that we go to when we answer some of the harder questions. We got to go to the easier questions and say, well, do we even obey this? Because, I mean, it's not going to make much of a difference if you're not obeying the simplest things that God told you to obey. So it doesn't make any sense. I mean, think about it. It doesn't make sense to answer a question like this if you can't even obey this part. So, again, we're going to keep going. But I just want to throw that out there that it's important. It's very important because you want to have the most integrity that you can in the Bible. You want to say, God, I'm, I know. Come on. We all fall down. A just man falleth seven times. We, we all fall down. I understand that. But we don't justify falling down. We don't try to fall down. We don't try to sin. That's not, that shouldn't be the heart of the Christian. So we ought to obey as much as we can in the right mind, in the right integrity of our heart, to obey as much as we can. And that way when we're, we're dealing with God, when we're communicating with God, we can actually communicate in a heart of belief and faith, Right? Nobody, nobody's going to be have it absolutely right in every area of their lives, but we can try our best to do as much as we can. Okay, I think that would be a good attitude, a good approach as we're going to these passages. So let's go to verse two. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. That's the reason why you're not to touch a woman. You see that to avoid fornication. Now. Think about this. Again, we don't we have a hard time trying to keep these verses, but we think that we can control ourselves. So we'll hold hands. We can control ourselves. So we'll kiss on the cheek. We can control ourselves. We'll be alone with the person that we're courting without a third wheel. We need a third wheel. We need a we need some people there to watch us to make sure that nothing happens. People don't do this kind of stuff, do they? They don't they don't avoid temptation they go actually go towards temptation 
So nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his what? His own wife. Why? Why? Because when the man has the urge to do something, he now has his wife to be intimate with, right? So if you don't want to be intimate with your wife, why did you get married? Well, I love my wife. Well, well of, of, of course, but with love comes intimacy. With love comes the marriage bed. It's a, it's a, it's a, it comes, it, it couples itself with the marriage. Okay. So think about this. First Corinthians 7, 1 and 2. We're talking about a husband and a wife. And we're talking about a man that can't contain himself. If he can't contain, he needs to get married. But now that you're married, you're going to put intimacy on hold. You're going to say, wait a minute. I don't love you anymore. Now, true, we can say with our mouths, we love our wives. But with love, does, does it not come with faithfulness? With love, does it not come with trustworthiness? Come on, with love. You have a bunch of attributes that come along with love. And one of the actions of showing your feelings and emotions towards your wife or your spouse, your husband or your wife, would be the intimacy that you share in the marriage bed. They will keep this clean. But that's what 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2 is about there. It's, I can't contain my lusts. I can't contain my desires. So the Bible says, wait, well, if you can't contain, marry. It's the right thing to do. Marry in the Lord. But, I, you know, I understand the whole lust thing, and I don't want to make it all about lust. But I always tell people, you got to couple up 1 Corinthians 7 with a lot of other passages. Because uh, marriage isn't just about intimacy, okay? Don't get me wrong. The question is involving intimacy and withholding that intimacy from your spouse or from your husband or wife. And so I want to be very careful with that, but that you would find a wife that's honoring to the Lord, that you, if you're a, a woman, you would find a husband that's honoring to the Lord, that he would be saved and so far. We can go down all of the attributes of what a kind of person that you ought to marry. And certainly these are all factors as well. I think first Corinthians seven is just giving you the warning of the, the power of the lust in the flesh. And that if you can't contain in that sense, then you ought to marry. It's the right thing to do than to go around fornicating and committing sin against your own body and God and everybody around you. Okay. So that's verse two. Now, verse three, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. This is huge. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. This is it's like a command from God. Look what it, let the husband render uh, unto the wife due ben, The wife, it gets due benevolence from the husband. It's due. It's due to her for you being her husband, saying those vows, making that promise, getting in that relationship for life. She is due benevolence. Now, let's, let's cover this whole benevolence thing. In an old Webster's 1828 dictionary, benevolence means the disposition to do good, goodwill, kindness, charitableness, the love of mankind accompanied with a desire to promote their happiness. The benevolence of God is one of his moral attributes, that attribute which delights in the happiness of intelligent beings. God is love, an act of kindness, good done, charity given. And point three, a species of contri contribution or tax illegally exacted by arbitrary kings of England. And we're not even dealing with that definition there. So it is important to note that both the husband and the wife are to show each other benevolence. But even more so, being married comes with its responsibilities given by God. Come on, we're talking about God. God said this. You didn't come up with this. God said this. If you want a successful marriage, you want a marriage that's honoring to God. Well, more so being married comes with its responsibilities given by God. Husband and wife are to give, get ready, do benevolence. Not just benevolence, 
do benevolence. There's a responsibility there. Okay. Now l- l- look at this. Uh, let the husband, verse three, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So both give the opposite due benevolence. Very important because that's, that's part of our question and answering our question right now. It is important to note that, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I already, wrote, I already read that part of my notes. So 1 Corinthians 7, 4, let's look at this. The wife hath not power of her own body. We're not talking about the spirit or the soul. We're talking about the body of flesh. The wife had not power of her own body, but the husband. What does that mean? The husband has power of her body. Now, what, what's the context? The context is husband and wife. The, the context is touching a woman. But now you're touching a woman the right way because you're married to her. <laughs> okay? So, so we're talking about we're talking about the marriage bed, the acts that we that they do in the marriage bed. Okay? You're doing this the right way. So the wife had not power of her of her own body, but the husband, and the likewise, also the husband had not power of his own body, but the wife. You see that? It's both sides. There's two parties involved in the marriage. You see that? It's not, no, honey, it's it's all about me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. No, no. You've got to give your your spouse or your the one you're married to do benevolence. You got to watch out when you do now, now we're going to get into the whole withholding, you know, things in the marriage bed. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to try to keep it as as general as I can. Okay. So the wife gives up power of her own body once she is married. The husband gives up power of his own body once he is married. Before marriage, you have power of your own body. That's before marriage. You say, no, I'm not going to be touched by this man. And the man says, no, I'm not going to be touched by this woman. I have power over my own body because I'm honoring the Lord as a saved member of the body of Christ. Now, do lost people do this? Maybe some, right? Some lost people. They go to school. I mean, think about there's some righteousness within lost people. Dads care about some. I'm going to say it all. Some dads care about the sanctity of, of their daughters. And they don't want their daughters to go out and fornicate, even though they're not saved. Come on. I mean, there is an element of light that God has given to every uh, every person. And some people respond to that light. And then they respond by some of these righteous acts. So that's pretty amazing to note. But what we're dealing with in 1 Corinthians 7, because a lot of these questions kind of interchange and intermingle because of different angles people want to come at. So sometimes it's good to mention that because I'm not saying that only Christians can understand this concept, but I'm saying that God says this is how we ought to be. And lost people don't have that kind of command to say, this is how it's supposed to be. But we do, because we have verses right out of the mind of God in the Holy Bible that state, this is how a marriage is supposed to be. Okay? So hopefully that'll, that'll be helpful in our, you know, as we're explaining this. So the context is dealing with saved people. Lost people have no power, right? They don't have any power. First John 2, 16, what is their power? Their power for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. They're more influenced by that. What are we influenced by? Well, here we are, 1 Corinthians 7. That's what we're influenced by. So what makes you have power of your own body before you're married is the fact that you have the power of Christ living within you as a saved member of the body of Christ. Galatians 2.20. You have the power of God the Father living within you, Ephesians 4.6. And you have the power of the Holy Spirit living within you, 1 Corinthians 6.19. You have access to the power of the scriptures, Hebrews 4.12, 2 Timothy 3.16. That's very important. Now, you have no excuse to say, well, I'm withholding intimacy in the marriage bed because of X, Y, and Z. You have no excuse to say that. Why? Because we just read it. <laughs> you don't have power of your own body, right? Um, neither does your wife have power of her own body. Uh, things have changed once you've gotten married. Things have changed. 
But the problem is, if you believe the Bible, then things have changed. If you don't believe the Bible, you're going to have problems in your marriage. All right, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. What does defraud mean? Defraud mean, means, according to the Noel Webster's 1828, to deprive of right, either by obtaining something by deception or artifice, or by taking something wrongfully without the knowledge or consent of the owner, to cheat, to cozen, followed by or before the thing taken as to defraud a man of his right. So point two, to withhold wrongfully from another what is due to him. Remember the due benevolence we were talking about? Wow, defraud not the hirelings of his wages. And point three, to prevent one wrongfully from obtaining that or, or what he may justly claim. The husband can justly claim the body of his wife. The wife can justly claim the body of her husband. Four, to defeat or frustrate wrongfully. Okay, so there's some, there's some definitions right there for, for uh, defraud. Now, do you remember we mentioned the word consent, right? Defrauding not one another, except it be with consent for a time. To see the word consent, let's look that word up. So that word means in Noel no Webster's 18.28, it means consent. It means agreement of the mind to what is proposed or state by another. Accord, hence a yielding of the mind or will to that which is proposed as a parent gives his consent to the marriage of his daughter. We generally use the word in case where power, rights, and claims are concerned. You know, I'm going to stop right there because I think we pretty much got our, you know, our definitions of defraud and consent. Consent is, it's a legal term and how we're using it in the marriage is legal. You, you, you are legally allowed the, to have power over the body of your, your loved one, the, the one you're married to. That's what we're talking about. It's a legal claim. It's, you're not doing anything wrong. But what's the problem if you don't have two consenting parties that agree that God says this is how it's supposed to be? You're going to have problems in your marriage bed. Okay, it's very important that both agree, correct? You can't have one, you know, not agree and the other one say, well, you have to agree. You must agree. No, both parties have to agree to this because it's legally right by God. Very important. Don't defraud one another because when you're not consenting to what is justly right by God, then you got to, remember we talked about it earlier, you got to examine yourselves. And I don't mean whether you're in the faith. I mean, examine yourselves in your marriage. Examine yourselves if you're truly obeying God in your marriage vows and in the intimacy you're supposed to have with your wife, according to 1 Corinthians 7, and vice versa. Okay? Very important. So consent is important. Not defrauding one another is important concerning the marriage bed. And hold on, incontinency. So let me read it again. Let, let's read the verse again, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Defraud ye not one another. Okay, we understand that. Except it be with consent for a time. Now, let's stop right there. I, I want to get to incontinency, but let's stop right here for a second. Except it be with consent for a time. There's a comma right there. It's not any time. Now, again, and I don't want to be dogmatic about this. I'm, I'm really not too keen on what it actually means right there concerning, except to be with consent for a time, that it could be a standalone thing. Maybe you're in the hospital, right? And you can't do anything. But your wife's like, no, we got, no, come on now. <laughs> you got to consent. And so you see what I'm saying? Um, there may be some leeway there for that. You know, if you, you're, you're, you're enabled, if you're paralyzed, you're enabled to do anything. Okay. So I believe that there may be some leeway there, but look at the comma. It kind of, kind of leans towards 
the reason uh, of this whole consenting for a time concerning that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Because that's what it sounds like in the context that, um, well, except to be for consent for a time, meaning, well, we can't do anything right now. Come on, we got to give ourselves to fasting and prayer. We're not doing anything right now. So it seems like it could lean that direction as well. And come to and come together again. So after you're giving yourself to fasting and prayer, you come together again. Well, we're talking about the marriage bed, right? You come together again. You're doing what a husband and wife does, intimacy in the bed. That Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. So what I think is, uh, except to be with consent for a time, if it's, if it's, Dealing with the conditions of 1 Corinthians 7, 5, then you're justified with, you know, there's a time when you don't have to do anything because there's other things that you're doing or there's other conditions that are there that don't allow you to do that intimacy in the bed. Okay, then if you take that and abuse it, then it can turn into Satan tempting you uh, for your incontinency. Now, you say, well, what is incontinency? I, I need to know what that is. Okay, well, here we go. Let's let's define what incontinency is, and you'll see it ties right in to what we're saying. So if you go to Noel Webster's 1828 Dictionary and you look up incontinency, it is a want of restraint of the passions or appetites, free or uncontrolled indulgence of the passions or appetites as of anger. Uh, point two, want of restraint of the sexual appetite. Free or illegal indulgence of lust, lewdness, used of either sex, but appropriately of the male sex. Incontinence in men is the same as unchastity in women. Uh, and then there, there's a point three that doesn't apply. It's, it's among physicians and how they define this a, a whole nother way. So incontinency is restraining yourself. Um, in, in the context of 1 Corinthians uh, 7, 7, 5, it's dealing with uh, restraining yourself from any intimacy in the bed. Uh, and it can turn into Satan tempting you for your incontinency so you're not having any at all anymore when you, when you ought to or you should. Um, especially if it's only going one direction and if it's only going one direction and, you know, say the husband, you know, wants to all the time and the woman's saying, no, 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 no. And it's not even consent for a time, but that Satan is tempting her for her incontinency. Well, then that can turn into sin. See, see what we're, see what we're talking about. Uh, is it a sin to withhold intimacy in the bed, in the marriage bed? And, it can turn into that. I believe so. Now, you remember what I said earlier? What would cause somebody to withhold intimacy in the marriage bed? Do you understand pornography? Pornography and many other things of like nature and lewdness and, uh, you know, uh, sexual immorality and all these things um, that deal in the sexual sense of sin and the lust of the of mind, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, all these things, all these lustful things, lasciviousness and all this stuff. All your mind could be devoted on that and thus neglect your marriage bed. All your mind and focus is on that. And a lot of times it does, it affects your marriage. So do you see how, if, if that's the case, then you're, you're definitely in sin. You need to repent. You're neglecting your wife. You're neglecting your husband based upon these sins. And thus it affects your daily life and your, your, just your normal you know, verbal relationship as well as the intimacy in the bed. So that can really turn into a, to sin and very dangerous, very dangerous. Uh, repent of pornography, repent of all that stuff, uh, cheating and looking at mag dirty magazines, uh, repent of all that. Your mind should be focused on your wife and the Lord. But uh, remember, remember in, in first Corinthians, it talks about how you may please or, or uh, 
You are, you are doing the things in the world to please your wife. That's 1 Corinthians 7. And it's not, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and read some of this. Hold on, hold on real quick. I'm going to find where I left off here. Look at 1 Corinthians 7.33. This is just exactly what I'm just, I was just mentioning. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world. He didn't say you're caring about the world. And the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, love the Father's not in him. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about he's caring for the things of the world. His wife is in a body of flesh. She's not some spirit being walking around. She's in the flesh. And so he has to care for the things in the world concerning pleasing his wife. So he's not caring for the world, the things in the world to please his wife. That's what we're talking about. So you don't only have a relationship with God, you have a wife now. You have to care about your relationship with your wife, okay? It's very important, and you've got to be balanced in that, okay? Very important. Now look at verse 34, 1 Corinthians 7, 34. There is, a, there is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, now watch how she may please her husband. You see how it's on both sides of the ball field. The husband has to do it for the wife, and the wife has to do it for the husband. You see that? It, it's, it's both need to consent to what's just and what's right by the Lord. Very important. Otherwise, Satan's going to jump in that thing, and he's just going to destroy the whole thing. Okay? You don't want that to happen to your marriage. So a married woman should not care for the things of the world, but care for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Okay, so very important. This will help you. And I try to keep it as clean as we can on here. But intimacy is important. Relationship is important. When you speak with your wife every day, um, all these things are important. They all build up a healthy marriage. And it's, and, and, and it's all based upon the foundation of thus saith the Lord. Okay. Now, if you're responding to your marriage on things the Lord said, then that's going to be that's going to be the climax of healthiness in your marriage. Okay. So hopefully, uh, yes. And, and according to his question, yes. If you withhold intimacy from the marriage bed, and you are not meeting the condition or the conditions of First Corinthians seven to withhold intimacy in the marriage bed then that can that can turn into sin and on the other hand there is some withholding as you can see uh but if you withhold and you're doing it justly according to conditions of first corinthians 7 then that's legitimate but then you but then the bible says you still need to be careful because it can turn into satan tempting you for your incontinency so just be very very careful withholding that okay it's, it's it can turn really bad for you okay so hopefully you'll take that in a good spirit uh i'm gonna go ahead and let justin go ahead and handle this go ahead brother sure all right so uh to start off with uh, <clears throat> let's get a couple of places here let's go to ephesians chapter five let's start there ephesians chapter five we'll try and make this as helpful as we can. Ephesians chapter 5. And look at verse number 25. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church Amen. and gave himself for it. A and uh, you know, I assume the question arises from somebody with marriage problems somewhere. The root of these problems is found here. Love your wives. I'll show you another one. Look at Titus. Book of Titus. Chapter number two. Titus chapter two. The Bible says in verse number three, the aged women likewise, that they may be in be, uh, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, 
to love their husbands. Amen. To love their children. So, so first and foremost, let me say this before we get into these types of things. It is paramount for a successful relationship between a man and a woman that they love one another. And that is, that is not the modern day world definition of sin. Love, love for one another is much more and so much more. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So love is not lust. Love is not sin, right? Uh, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, right? So, so loving one another is absolutely essential. Loving one another is absolutely essential. Uh, let's get um, one other place here, and we can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Actually, let's get two, two other places, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's get Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. And uh, I will also say, well, actually, I'll say this later. So Song of Solomon, chapter 1. And the Bible says, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine, because the savor of thy good ointments. Thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love thee. Draw me. Draw me. We will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. So what is, what is that saying there? First of all, it's, it's the woman desiring her husband, the husband desiring the wife. But there's drawing one another. There's, there's a winning of one another. The, the husband loves his wife, therefore he wins her confidence. The wife loves her husband, therefore she wins his confidence. And those things, being honest, I think they tend to fall into place if you get that in order. If you get the loving your wife in order, and wives, if you get the loving your husband in order, and, and you win one another's confidence... With that love, I think those things fall fall right in place. Uh, let's go to First Peter, chapter number three. First Peter, chapter number three. The Bible gives some very clear uh, direction here. Verse number one. We'll just read through these. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word. They also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. So first of all, what is the wife supposed to do? And, and we're not talking intimacy at the moment. We're talking subjection. The wife should obey the husband. The wife should reverence the husband. And that's clear Bible teaching. But if your husband's disobedient, you don't preach at him. You win him. Right? Isn't that what it said? That they also may without the word be one. What we just read in first uh, Song of Solomon, chapter one, draw me, draw me. The husband draws the wife. The wife draws the husband because of your good, proper, in fact, that, that word, Brother Ed hit it right on the head, benevolence, first Corinthians chapter seven, benevolence. That's, that's your answer. What, yeah. what do you think? Do good, the, the disposition to do good to be kind, to show kindness, charitableness, the desire to promote the other happiness. Amen. Right? So, so before you go down that road of intimacy, withhold intimacy, etc., let's get these things straightened out. Because if you love one another, and if you win one another with your conversation, that's not just what, that's not what you speak, right? By the, by the context, that's how you live. 
how you live your life should show that other person that they should have confidence in you, that they can have confidence in you, that you should win them with your love, with your benevolence, with your desire to please the other person, right? I mean, and that is, this is Bible principle through and through and what works outside and in, outside of the home and in the church and out in the world also works at home. Benevolence, do good to one another. Try to make the other person happy, right? That's, that's laying down your life for the other person. That is love. Amen. That is love. So, so anyway, I just, I thought we would start there before we go down this road, because if you don't get these things solved, that other thing, it's going to be a problem no matter what. Everything's going to be a problem no matter what. So these, these things, I would say, are of the utmost importance that husbands should love their wives. Wives should love their husbands. Oh, before we leave 1 Peter chapter 3, because this is just too good to, to keep passing up. Uh, but verse number 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair or wearing of gold or putting on an, of apparel. Listen, nothing against gold, nothing against doing up your hair or makeup or anything like that, because God put it right next to getting dressed. Right? <laughs> okay, that's that's not saying those things are sin, but that's that's not what's going to win that person. Looking nice on the outside is is nice. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not going to win the other person, right? And if all you have is a relationship based on looking nice on the outside, you're going to get old. Let me help you with that. You're going to get old. You're a young man. you you be like me one day, you lose your hair. <laughs> you know, you get old and things happen. That physical body breaks down and deteriorates. What are you going to do when you're 50, 60, 70 years old? You better have something more than just the physical. So hey, uh, verse number four, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, that be the Lord, right? The, the man inside, that's, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their uh, own husbands. Uh, notice also, we probably say this enough, but it's your own husband. You go to work and you can be in subjection to your boss, but when you come home, how's that work out? Mm. Being honest, right? No, too. Right. The, be in subjection under your under their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. God took care of Sarah. But Abraham wasn't the greatest husband in the world. He certainly didn't win man of the year for many years. But uh, but God took care of Sarah. Likewise, now you say, well, Brother Justin, you're just hammering on women. Verse 7, likewise, all right? We gave some instruction to the wife. Let's turn that thing around. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Can I say this? Don't be stupid. You're not stupid. You know how to dwell with your wife in peace. Right? Can I, can I say that? Dwell with them according to knowledge. Giving, how do we do this? Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. She's not meant to take all the stuff you take. Right? Why, you know, we talk about the men going out and work and women stay home and guide the home, raise children, all that stuff. That's good. That's right. We're all for that. Why? Because I, you know, I can go out in the world, get kicked around a bit, and come home, I'm okay. Don't kick your wife around. That's not how that works. Right, they're giving honor unto the wife is unto the weaker vessel. Brother James always has a really good uh, comparison. Men are more like Tupperware. You could toss them, you could put them in the microwave, you, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. The the women are more like a a fine glass vase or vase or whatever you want to call it. I don't know how you say that thing, but in any case, how do you handle that? 
You don't toss that thing around. You're careful with it. You're Amen. gentle with it, right? So dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. So let me say this. Number one, if you do get this figured out, you have a happy marriage. It is the grace of life. There, there's nothing better, honestly, than having... It, in, in God established the family, having a wife that loves you and you loving your wife and having children that love you and loving your children, that, that's the greatest thing in the world. Amen. And Amen. Part, part, you know, in this world, not talking about not being saved and uh, being saved all, ultimate and, uh, and knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is ultimate, but, but having a good relationship with your spouse, having a good relationship with your children. That's the grace of life. And that your prayers be not hindered. Amen. Let me say this. If you guys don't get along, you're not loving your wife like Christ loved the church. And then you go to God, oh God, please do this. Oh God, please help me with that. You think he's listening? If you're not treating your wife right wives if you're not treating your husband right being honest god said it your prayers are hindered yes sir hindered. yes sir that's what he said uh we could get that in malachi but we're not we're not going to take that time but here here's the here's the answer finally be all of one mind having compassion one of another love is brethren brethren be pitiful be courteous not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing. Sometimes you might say something that's not best to say it nicely. Sometimes your spouse may say something that's not best. How should you handle that? Not render railing for railing or evil for right. evil, but contrary wise blessing benevolence, be good, be kind, seek to please the other. Uh, four, this is good. This, I get every new couple that gets married. This is what I tell them. First Peter chapter three, this passage for he that will love life. I want to love life. You want to love life. I want to love life for he that will love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil. You see that? Let him refrain his tongue from evil. Amen. And his lips that they speak no guile. Careful what you say. Let me say that. You say something that's not best to your wife. You can't unsay that. Wives, you say something that's not best for your husband. You can't unsay that. Right. Right? God put two gates. Teeth, mouth. Watch what you say. When you, when you sp speak those things, when you talk to them in that way, when you say those things, listen, you can't undo that. So, he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil. Stay away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So uh, just really, I wanted to try and lay that foundation real quick. We'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and just hit a few things here. You know, uh, read through it and just comment briefly. Now, uh, verse number 1, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now, concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Brother Ed said it. And listen, if you're saved and you're not married, you don't touch. You don't handhold, you don't hug, you don't do any of that stuff <laughs> till the day that you, with your lips, make a vow before God and man that you guys are going to enter into marriage. Amen. So, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, not somebody else's wife. You get your own wife. Right. And let every woman have her own husband, not somebody else's husband. You get your own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Man, you get a hold on that. Brother Ed gave that definition. Write that thing down and memorize it. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, 
If you get these things in order, the rest takes care of itself. Uh, the husband, render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise, also the wife unto the husband, do uh, uh, likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body. Now, some man might step in there and say, well, see, she needs to listen to me. She needs to do this. She needs to do it. Listen, read the rest of the verse. But the husband, and likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So it's right. still joint. It still must be consensual. You Amen. guys must agree. You must have one another's confidence. You must have right. one another's love. You must have a desire to please and, and do good to the other for this Amen. whole thing to work. And so he gives clear, clear instruction to add to it. Defraud you not one the other, except you be with consent for a time. And that's that's okay. It's okay for a husband and wife to agree to not uh, be intimate for a time. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But of course, you always want that to be for a time that you may be uh, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Come together again. Let Satan tempt you not for your incontinency, which is exactly like Brother Ed said. You, people, especially in this day and age, I, I, I assume I, I've never lived in any other day and age but they have a hard time controlling themselves. So you have to be able to understand that and know that the man and the woman, you're, you've entered into that marriage relationship. You should do everything to win it, one another's confidence, to please one another, to do good to one another. And I think this part uh, really just kind of takes care of itself if you guys would do the rest. So I'm going to leave it right there. We're a few minutes after and, uh, Thanks again for the for the questions, and we'll uh, let Brother Ed close us out here. Hey Amen. All right. Well, I appreciate Brother Justin. Uh, guys, um, uh, the, this kind of a question isn't uh, really answered a lot at church, you know, just on a normal service. Uh, a lot of times people deal with questions like this, you know, um, in marriage counseling, stuff like that. So you won't a lot of times you won't hear sermons on this kind of stuff. So, and I understand the curiosity. Um, certainly we want to know um, every area of our lives and what's going to be honoring to God. And, and, and it is a legitimate question. Um, certainly it, it can help if you rightly divide and get as much as you can from the word of God. So you can make an objective decision that's honoring to God and in, in even in your, your marriage bed. And I think that's so important that uh, if, if we keep the right focus on God, then even the problems we think we have in this flesh can work itself out if you just keep honoring God every day in your life and respond to the word of God um, in all matters of faith, practice in life and marriage. So um, again, um, it's sometimes things don't, you know, work themselves out because you already dug yourself a big hole, uh, you know, wages of sin is death. And you might've killed maybe a lot of your relationship with your wife, but um, maybe relationships with your kids. But why don't you start right now and start making decisions from the Bible, rightly divided and start there. You may not be able to fix every, everything, but you can at least commit to have that starting point where you're just going to obey the Bible, obey the word of God and respond to God in truth and integrity of your heart and just start there and just try your best from that point on to live for Jesus. And a lot of times, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm not making any promises here, but a lot of times, sometimes these things can, can work themselves out, especially with the integrity of you, uh, consistently obeying the Bible and your family seeing that testimony and you can see how God can maybe fix a lot of these things through your obedience to the word of God. So um, just want to encourage you with that as well. Um, some people it's too late to salvage a marriage, but for some, you still may be able to have some spiritual fight in this thing. And I, I think your marriage is worth the fight. I really believe that um, Jesus Christ fights for his bride 
uh, even though we mess up all the time as the church, um, I think our our marriages are worth the fight. Okay, um, I just always, as a as a minister and preacher of the gospel, as well as Justin as a minister and preacher of the gospel, I believe that we both would agree that you may have you may think in your mind you have some justifications to leave your spouse and to maybe e even talk to many people around you and them all agree that you're justified in leaving your spouse. Um, I, I believe that God, even though, I mean, God is, God has done been done wrong more in a relationship as having a, a wife than any, any human being to ever live. Um, and God takes back Israel and God, the father takes back Israel. And in, in spite of the church, a lot of times being no better than Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ looks at his wife and and he says, yeah, this marriage is inevitable. This marriage is coming. And I love, I love my wife. She messes up all the time, but I, I love my wife. And, you know, you just got to, if you look at it through the eyes of God, a lot of, a lot of us don't, but if you look at it through the eyes of God, the most worst horrendous sins that happen to God, he's forgiven his wife, because of his, what Brother Justin said, because of his benevolence, his due benevolence, and his love towards his wife. It's not, it's not anything the wife is doing that keeps God loving the wife. It's just the fact that the father is love, and he loves his wife, regardless of anything the wife does. Man, can we have a love like that for our wives? Can we have a love? Can a wife have a love like that for her husband? I tell you this, most marriages would be fixed if you could just look at your spouse, look at your husband, look at your wife in the eyes that God looks at. I mean, what a great thing. I, I think that'd be so great. God is always in the, in the business of reconciliation, always. Whether it's the lost person to get to Jesus Christ and be saved forever and have a relationship with God, God's in the business of reconciliation as well as your marriage. So anybody that would say it is God's will for me to get a divorce, I, I am not believing that for one minute. I understand their circumstances. I've heard over the years, of be, and I know Justin has as well, we've heard over the years many, many different circumstances that people get into and we would cringe at. I mean, we would listen to some situations and be like, wow, yeah, that's a really tough situation to be in. And then, and then somebody wants to ask, well, what is your biblical take on this? And I don't, I don't have a questionable doubt in my mind, even though the situation's really bad. And I speak as a man as, well, you probably ought to leave that person. But if I speak as a minister of the Bible, I always got to reach for reconciliation no matter what, because that's how God is. I should be in hell right now, right now. All of us should be in hell right now. All the wicked, horrendous things I've done that I know that God should say, you did that. I don't want you. I don't want nothing to do with you. You have made me angry. You're an abomination. Go to hell. That would be the real terminology of going to hell right there when God says it to you. But, you know, he doesn't do that to us. So in the light of this amazing grace, this amazing mercy that God's given to me, if I speak personally as a, as a lost man who ended up getting saved, and then I look at how he placed me into his, the body of Christ, which is the bride of Christ, and says, be a member of the body of Christ, and I'm worthy not only to be saved, but to have a relationship with God, and even more so to have a more intimate relationship with God as his bride in the church. How much more should we look at our at, at the one we're married to and say, what a great example of people that don't deserve to marry Jesus Christ, and yet 
we nitpick at every little thing about our spouse and get angry and over small things. And we're like, well, I'm leaving. I'm going to get a divorce. And you get with somebody else, same thing happens. You get a divorce. It, it, it makes a mockery of the salvation that you have in Christ if you're saved. Because marriage is an institution from God. And God meant it to last till death do you part. That's what he meant. And he, he means what he says. I have no shadow of a doubt that God wants you to reconcile your marriage today if you're, if you're stuck somewhere right now and you're thinking, well, I'm just going to get a divorce and somehow it's going to be justified by God. I'm, I'm, beckoning with, I'm beckoning with you today. I'm pleading with you today. Consider your marriage. Consider God wanting you to reconcile your marriage. I can't make you. Or Justin can't make it. We can't make anybody do anything. But we would like you to consider the love that God has for you and all of the things that he set aside and said, I could use all these things against you, but I'm not because I love you. I have due benevolence towards you because I made a promise to you. And a lot of times it feels to God like it's a one-sided thing. It's a one-sided deal. But that's what love is. Sometimes it feels like it's one-sided but you still reach out because it's love. Amen. So if you're not saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins by believing that Christ died for your sins and rose again the third day. And you could have uh, forgiveness of sins, eternal life. And what we're talking about today, reconciliation to God. What a great thing. Now I'm going to go ahead and let Justin close out and we'll end it there. Go ahead, brother. Amen. I'm going to add to that, you know, brother Ed, uh, hit it right on the money there. The Bible says the Lord hateth putting away. Amen. He said that. He said that the Lord hateth putting away. And uh, that's, of course, talking about divorce, a man putting away his wife, wife putting away her husband. Um, and Jesus Christ said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. If, if he can say that and put up with us, we should be able to put up with one another, right? In fact, so much more, more than just putting up with, I'm telling you, you, you can be heirs together of the grace of life. Amen. If you'd be willing, if you would be willing to love one another, to win one another's confidence and to, uh, to show benevolence, to show benevolence. Amen. That that's God put it there for a reason. Amen. <laughs> benevolence. So do good. Try try and promote the others' happiness. Right. We're we're memorizing the book of Philippians. Let each esteem other better than themselves. I'm telling. That's you want the answer. There's your answer. Let each esteem other better than themselves. That's how you should look at it. That's how you should look at it. Try and make the other person happy and you'll be happy. You'll find you'll, you'll be heirs together. You will inherit together the grace of life, having that, having that joyous marriage. So I want you to have that. I want it to be a blessing to you. And uh, if you have questions, again, always just email the uh, trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com and we'll, uh, we'll do our best. God bless you. Have a good night. Amen. Have a good night.